Andy, I know you've never been happier than when you're sitting by a warm fire, snuggled up in a flannel and basking in the glow of an old school budget spreadsheet. (sighs) It is a special day I can shut down the world for a little me time. In a world full of applications, why do these antiquated documents and spreadsheets still run the world? And why haven't they been updated in over 50 years? That's why we want to talk about Coda. Coda is a new kind of doc that brings words, data, and teams together. It comes with a set of building blocks that anyone can combine to create a doc as powerful as an app. Coda runs our entire business here at True Story FM, from show scheduling across dozens of podcasts and scripts for thousands of episodes, to budgets and plans and wikis and more. Coda lets us see our business in a new light. If you'd like to shine a light on productivity in your business and save money along the way, check out Coda today at thenextreel.com slash Coda. It's hard to believe that we've been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. So many great conversations over the years about so many great movies. All that said, producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. Becoming a Next Real member gives you access to all sorts of additional and exclusive content. Plus, you're helping us keep the lights on. Just head to thenextreel.com slash membership, where you can learn more about becoming a member, which costs a measly $5 a month, practically the same as one fancy coffee drink. And you get so much more. Every month, we record a bonus episode exclusively for members. Those episodes cover movies from whatever series we're covering at the moment, or add to previous series. Some movies we've covered that only members get to hear us discuss include The Blues Brothers, The Russia House, Naked Lunch, Independence Day, The Hot Rock. And Relic, the better one. Plus, members get to vote on what we're going to discuss for those episodes. We also record additional pre- and post-show content in regular episodes that only members get to hear. Like conversations about similarly themed movies. And answering listener questions from our live member chat. Speaking of our live member chat, we record almost all of our episodes in Discord, where members can chat right along with us live. Members get access to other members-only channels in our Discord community as well. On top of all that, members get all episodes a full week earlier than everyone else in a private Next Reel feed just for them that includes all the shows in the Next Reel family. The Next Reel, the film board, movies we like, sitting in the dark, and more new projects on the way. To top it all off, members don't have to listen to ads. We've already eliminated those annoying, dynamically inserted ads that, let's face it, we all hate it. We are listening to you. We love podcasting for a living, and those ads help to pay the bills. Now, we're counting on you, dear listener. We promise we aren't going back to those terrible, dynamically inserted ads that don't relate to us at all. All we ask is that you consider supporting the Next Real family of podcasts with a membership. Again, it's $5 per month or $55 per year. Just head to thenextreel.com slash membership. Thenextreel.com slash membership. Get your access to early ad-free episodes with bonus content, member bonus episodes, and access to member channels and live streams in Discord by signing up today. Welcome to Take 10. Welcome to Take 10. I am your host, Kyle Olson. With me is my co-host, my animated sidekick, Rob Cabasco. Hey! Do you That's, mind that being was an animated a, sidekick? That was, um, I don't know if that was an animated hey. It was just a, <laughs> well, hello, Kyle. How are you doing? No. Happy so, to be uh, here. So it is, we decided to do something different. We we For the previous episodes, we had sort of been doing sort of full works, I guess it would be. It would be like full episodes, full seasons, full movies. We decided to do something fun and different this time. We decided to do animated sequences. So what does that mean? Well, instead of talking about what's the greatest animated film or anything... We were sort of talking about like just moment that happens in the different movies, and really the rules. It doesn't even have to be from an animated movie. Like if you want to right. talk about, you know, the Pink Panther title sequence or whatever, that's fine. But like we talk about a a sequence in a movie 
that is animated. And that's pretty much the only caveats we put on. So we're going to each have our five favorite animated sequences uh, and then discuss them. And that's pretty much all we've talked about in advance. So neither of us know what the other one's going to say. So this should be interesting. So hopefully you'll oh, find I'm, something fun that you've never seen before. In this. I'm really looking forward to this. And might I add, like when I did my when I picked my five, plus yeah. there's bonuses. Yes. I really went for the sequences that that really I remember. Like again, you and your great point about it's not about the best movie or anything yeah. like that. These are sequences that I just could not forget, and there's one in particular that I immediately thought of when you told me the idea for this for this episode. Yeah, and, and so my last one will be the one that sort of inspired this whole thing because there uh, there's Thanks. one particular sequence that I, I thought like is just in a in a good movie is a great great moment, and so I thought we should need to talk about that kind of thing. So yes, they could be exciting or thrilling or sad or funny or whatever it is. Uh, they're just going to talk about that. So you want to uh, take the first one, Rob? I will. Okay, and I'm well. I'm going to start with the one that this is the literally the first one I thought of. Oh, okay. Um, so this is from the 2011 computer animated film by DreamWorks, Kung Fu Panda 2, the oh, sequel. Okay. And uh, the reason why I picked this one, I okay, I think everyone can say if you're if you are a Pixar snob, yeah. and and I think we are to certain degrees. I certainly <laughs> am. But I will tell you, I I think the the whole Kung Fu Panda trilogy was brilliant. And I and I think it really is the first time, really maybe the first time you saw a company other than Pixar really establish themselves as a a a well versed purveyor of computer animated film. Like I, I yes. do think it really just it works. All three of them work. I love the cast, the animation, the story, the music, all of it. It was uh, the first thing I think DreamWorks put out that really had heart to it. Yes. Oh, like, and that's I mean, the, obviously Madagascar has made a, a bunch of money and stuff too, right. but I, I find it kind of soulless. Right. Right. I would put Shrek with that. Like, it yeah, doesn't... I agree. Yeah. It's, no, it's, it's, it's sort of a cynical um, snobbery to, to some of their stuff. And, and, and also, kind of lazy writing. Sorry, no, guys. it's... Yeah, no. I agree, totally agree. Kung Fu Panda is fantastic. So the reason why I picked the sequel is there is a moment in the sequel. Um, and if you remember the sequel, this is uh, based on uh, the Peacocks. So mm -hmm. the movie begins with this kind of wonderful... Um, it's kind of like a mix between watercolor and hand-drawn, like almost like uh, tissue paper animation of the story that the Peacocks invented fireworks, but one of their own basically realized I could use the fireworks for, for nefarious purposes. And then he becomes the antagonist of the, of the film in this one. Mm -hmm. But there is a moment where one of the plot lines is that Poe, who's the, the panda voiced by Jack Black, is trying to remember his mother, trying to remember what happened to his mother. And he keeps trying to have these memories and, and you know, and the, finally gets to this one point where uh, he's being tutored by this other character and he does this whole like sort of thing with the water droplet and he starts to have the full memory of with his mother. And the reason why I talk about the sequences is that to show the difference, it uses that same type of animation that the, that the opening uh, of the movie is that watercolor slash paper tissue paper sort of style. And what you find out is, is that his mother sacrificed himself, sacrificed herself to save young Poe from the peacocks. Hmm. But the most beautiful part is he's having the memory. It's all in that other style of animation. And then the moment he gets to where he never could remember what happens next, it goes to the fully realized 3D animation. And you see her place the baby Poe with these, with these vegetables and stuff. And she tearfully says goodbye to him and then goes up to literally divert the attention of the peacock and be mm -hmm. murdered. Yeah. I will tell you this. It is There might be tears in this episode because there's a <laughs> lot of sequences that really, really touch me. You can just play that, minute, that moment right now, and I am totally in tears. Wow. The music swells. It is a gorgeous score. And just that moment, I don't think you, you – I always think of this scene because it shows the power of not just animation – the power of styles and juxtaposing those two different styles where it it immediately you realize, oh, he's seeing it's now gone from distant memory, foggy memory mm -hmm. to something real that he is experiencing again. Right. It goes from a story to an experience. And yes. the shift in animation just makes it, yeah, come to life. Oh, this, okay. I mean, yeah. just stop what you're doing. Go watch Kung Fu Panda 2. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a, Kung Fu Panda 2 is a, is a great, great sequel. I See, for me, the moment that almost made it onto this list was the very end. 
Poe facing off against an entire armada. Oh, because well, yeah. that sequence is amazing in terms of storytelling, in terms of animation, uh, in terms of like culmination of uh, emotional beats. I mean, yeah. the payoff of of the water, the water yes, droplet, which you keep seeing, yeah. and then you get the payoff. Yeah. No, it, it could have been there too, but this is yeah. the this is the one I immediately went to when you said this. So, yeah. Kung Fu Panda nice. too. All right. All right. So mine is a little further back. Mine is from actually from uh, the late 90s. So obviously you can't do something like this without mentioning the Walt Disney Animation Studio. But I uh, decided to try something a little different. So there for a while in the 90s, Disney Animation got suddenly went from like, oh, it's a little cottage thing. We just put out a movie every three or four years to suddenly huge things. Suddenly we have Little Mermaid. You have Beauty and the Beast. You have Lion King. These gigantic things that suddenly are now consuming everyone's attention and, and you know, the, the world is suddenly paying attention to these. And so the animation then got that much bigger, that much bolder, and that much more ambitious. So much so that we always think of Walt Disney Animation as being a California company. Like there's the building that you can drive by with the giant hat on it and stuff too. But for a while, there was that was not the only place that was making these things. They actually had a Florida studio that you could go and visit. And that's like where Mulan came out of there. But... In addition to that, they also had one all the way over in France. So there was actually a Walt Disney Animation France, and they did a bunch of uh, animated stuff too. Their, the biggest thing they, they ever did was a Goofy movie, which is worthy of discussion, but not what we're talking about here. So <laughs> one of the things I think was, was, was great is that Disney tried to do to be sort of, I would say, a little overambitious. Once Beauty and the Beast got nominated for an Oscar, suddenly Jeffrey Katzenberg got stars in his eyes and wanted to have the first Best Picture winner as, as, as an animated feature. And so they he you know, that's where Pocahontas came from. And also this movie, which we're talking about here, is The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Now, problematic film? Yes, I would say. I still have a soft spot for it. I love the music. I think yes. the story is fantastic. I think it gets a bad rap. Uh, it could, but it, it, I acknowledge the fact that it is trying to do too many things. Yeah. But one of the things it does very well is set up the story. And so the sequence I'm talking about here is The Bells of Notre Dame. Oh. So they were trying to figure out how to set up this story and, and like, like what the world and, and animation. And so they wrote this piece and they sent this to Walt Disney Animation France. And they are the ones who animated that sequence. So that entire opening sequence with this song and like there's and there's Sturm and Drang and dramatic and you know betrayals and like all this stuff happens in the course of that song and that was all done by those animators uh, and I think it is it is a fantastic opening sequence really sets the the the, the stakes sets the tone uh, what the, here's what you're getting because everything that happens in the movie is all established in the course of that opening sequence and it was it's I still think it is a stunning piece of work Oh, what an awesome pick, man. I, yeah. You know what? This would have been... Well, this that is on my list of best animated films of all time, yeah. actually. I, like, I, I, yeah. I, have, I watched that so many times. I think The Hunchback is is a uh, underloved classic. It's... Uh, Warts and uh, all. Oh. I would say... Like, I, want, I will say... Oh, yes. yeah. Oh, totally. You, your criticism is valid. But yes, I, yes. I, and, I, and I say... I saw this when I was an adult, you know? So, like, I mean, yes. I, this isn't, like, something like, oh, I, I watched it when I was a kid on VHS a hundred times. Like, no. Like, I came to it as an adult... Uh, and 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 watched it and experienced it and and really felt a lot of emotion in that. Oh like, yeah, they no! They really do a nice job of. They did a um, you know, a little side note. They yeah. they did a phenomenal job, and I believe that the French team was probably more involved with this. They they did their whole study of. I mean, Notre Dame Cathedral is obviously mm -hmm. a Catholic church. There's parts of the mass in Latin, like strewn throughout yeah. the songs. I mean, no, they did their homework. They understood what they were doing and stuff. And that whole sequence of uh, Heaven's Light Hellfire, yes. where it's Quasimodo going into to Frollo. Yeah. Oh, my God. And, I mean, they deal with some really tough topics they in that do. film. Because they Frollo do. basically is, he's infatuated. He's lusting over Esmeralda. Right. All of it. But I agree with you. The opening really sets the tone because it's done by the, isn't it the jester? The jester is the one yeah, who's basically Klopan, telling the, the story. Yeah, the, Klopan, the, Klopan. Mm -hmm. Um Yes, he's telling the story to you know the, the kids of the town, and so he's and and the well and the big mystery of that is that it's also is who is the monster, who is the man, yeah. and you're you're immediately showing that yeah the, the teasing that it's the monster is not who you think it is, it's not the one who looks like the monster. Yeah, exactly. Oh, what a great pick! Yeah, thank Which you. Which I yeah. I think we've mentioned before that was slotted 
they've done a live stage adaptation of that film. Yes. And supposedly it is on the list for live action remakes, too. They did yes. one a while back. Um, that I think directly like the ABC original film of it, right. which was not great. Yeah, not great. <laughs> uh, but I think that it's it's uh, they're going to, to to do it at some point. Like it's on that list. They're, they're oh, working their way wow. down the thing. And I think I I think it might work better because yeah. oh absolutely people, especially people in America, have an instinctive thing of animations for kids. Like we're getting a, they're slightly getting away from that because there's stuff like Invincible is out there right now. I mean, like there right. are you know a, adult animated things that people. Uh, are watching but there's still that thing of like disney makes movies for kids and right. so like when they try and do something a little bit more uh, adult themed then it comes across as weird so they might actually taking almost everything including all the songs and putting them into a live action thing actually might work better well and what a what a interesting uh art and life convergence of they're going through the restoration of the actual cathedral right, <laughs> right. Yeah. like there's disney's gotta see there's amazing tie-in opportunities <laughs> Like yeah. if they do a you live know, action I, remake, I, I mean, I say that my my suggestion to whoever it is that is going to write that movie is start it that start it with that start it with the yes. excavation is going on and like somebody's walking through the thing and discovers something you know like a plot thing of there and like what is where did this come from and then from there you spin back to the bells like or or you know like maybe they find one of the bells that had fallen or something and like and that spins off into the Bells Notre Dame. You have a framing sequence of a modern during the restoration. You may or may not have given me goosebumps just now. <laughs> because that's brilliant. Yeah. Like, okay, go yeah. to get, do it. All right. Yeah, move there it up higher on your it. list. You yeah, know? do it. Do it. Do Don't it. Do, do it. rescuers next. Do the Hunt Back in Our Name live action. Oh, wow. What a thought. Oh, okay, wait. Yeah. All right. What, what do right. you got next? Okay. Well, interesting. Here, we'll we'll get we'll get all the religiosity out of the way. <laughs> so I'm gonna go with also not late 1990s, uh, 1998 American animated musical produced by DreamWorks, uh, The Prince of Egypt. Oh. And okay. So I pull this one. Uh, this was the first feature film from DreamWorks to be traditionally animated, mm -hmm. and it's an ad adaptation of the Book of Exodus. It's the, it's the story of Moses and his flight out of Egypt and a whole bunch of stuff it, well, that it, they, they take a the lot of liberties. The music is already playing in my head, Rob. Yeah, the, mu the, the music is amazing. Regardless of what your take is on yeah. uh, Old Testament or any type of things with scripture, mm -hmm. look, it is it is a really interesting, first of all, really interesting when you consider this was what DreamWorks decided to enter the room with. Right. Really, they took took quite a risk, but it is absolutely beautiful, um, beautiful amazing voice cast. Yes. I mean, Ralph finds uh, Patrick Stewart. Val Kilmer plays Val God. Val Kilmer, which that scene is, and that's not the scene. <laughs> no, no, that's but I'm that, sure that's scene's, not the scene. that scene's amazing. Yeah. Uh, Michelle Pfeiffer. I mean, Jeff Goldblum. I think is. I mean, like it's it's crazy. Um, so okay, so the 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 scene though that I'm gonna pick is, and and it's not aged really well, but I remember when I saw it in the theater, it just totally surprised me. Is like towards the end of the first act. Basically, the story of the character of Moses, he he is he has been uh, given away when he was a baby. He's raised by the Pharaoh. He has a chance meeting with his brother and sister, and he questions what his whole what, what's his backstory. He goes deep into the palace and he falls asleep and has a nightmare. And when he when he again, traditionally animated, his nightmare is computer generated. The hieroglyphics come to life on the walls of the of the building in darkness. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. It's I say. It's it maybe hasn't aged totally well because it makes it makes generous, let's say, overly generous generous use of the uh, boss emboss tool in in Photoshop or whatever <laughs> whatever tool they used. The the I mean it is the chisel and emboss is a little much, but it's so neat to see him him being animated in the style, and it's all taking place on the walls and these really cool like artistic touches where his mother and him as a baby they're trying to escape the soldiers. You see her hide around one of the columns. So, like, they took the really neat art direction of taking the ceiling and everything and all of these these just walls and having it be a part of the story. Yeah, it's really, really well done. Like, I watched it again for this, and I just thought, man, it still just blows me away when that comes in. I love that when you change the style of animation, but in this one, you've done it so well to really. I mean, if you want to use this term, you fully embrace the gimmick, right? Mm, because yeah. 
It yeah. uses all of the things that are about, you know, the, the walls and columns and ceilings, and you're using that to tell the story. It's fantastic. Prince of Egypt. The yeah. dream. And they they are just doing or were just about to do a Broadway version of it. And so the the cast album of that has come out and yes. the music is still astonishingly yes. good. Uh, yes. Steven Schwartz, who went on to do Wicked, uh, did the stuff there. He's his stuff is just amazing. All right. So uh, now we're shifting genres dramatically. Yes. We're shifting away from there and we're going into the realm of superheroes. So uh, this is one of the things that I I absolutely adore this movie, uh, but this is the sequence in this movie that made the hairs of my arm stand up. That it gives I I, I giggle with delight every time it happens. On a uh, secluded island, a brother and sister are trapped. The enemies are closing in. They don't know what's going to happen. Are will they get? Will they be killed? Will they be captured? They're not sure. And that's when the sister turns to her brother and says, "Dash, run." Oh. And thus starts one of the best animated sequence in all of Pixar history. Dash's first full-on, full speed run through the jungle as these flying saucers are chasing him. It's just astonishing. We've we'd never really seen super speed portrayed in a movie before like yeah. this. I mean, like there's been like Adventures of Bread and Munchausen had a little thing. There was the Flash anime, uh, the Flash live action series, and there have been some anime stuff, but never. Like this, where everything is consistent, and you got to see super speed done in a way no one had ever done before. And apparently this caused lots of long, long nights at Pixar, because at the time, the hardest things to animate were water and hair. And he's like, okay, I'm going to have a kid with long hair running over water. And they're like, you're going to what? Uh, and so for me, it culminates in my favorite moment, which is he Dash is running full out. They're, they're, ca- they're catching blast him, and he looks up, and he sees he's about to hit the water. And pauses for just a second, and like, ah! and like, and as he looks down, and then he sort of looks around and realizes he's running so fast, he can run across the surface of water. He looks down, giggles, and puts it into high speed. Right. Oh my god! I love it so much. Every time I watch the movie, I cheer audibly at that point. It is the best. The Incredibles is one of the best superhero movies of all time, but for me, that is the the best moment in that movie. No, you're. I I completely agree. It is the what really sells it is not just the the effects and and the realization of what that speed would look like. The moment where he doesn't know what's going to happen, and yeah. he looks down and realizes that he giggles. Yeah. Uh, the euphoria that that brings. Yes. It's in its Pixar. Pixar at its finest. Yeah. The, the, articulating real emotion. Yes. You know, r- a, a real active like uh, a, m- a moment of surprise within a character and yeah. how all Joy. that works. Yeah. Enjoy. That's exactly it. Uh, yeah. That's awesome. So good. All right, so right. this is well, okay, and I'm gonna here. I'm gonna go to another Pixar movie. So okay. it's, uh, it's funny oh, nice. how we, oh, we have a little I, bit I of movement. I should point out from this point on, no more Disney. That is like from my list. I have no more Disney stuff on there. So just, unless you people think that we're gonna be just chilling for Disney, I say the that is the last piece of Disney I have on here. Now, technically, because Disney <laughs> keeps buying everything, they might own some of these things. <laughs> but the, this no more from that. There, I'm going completely off of the Mouse House. Okay, I might have a few more. I, actually, I'm not, and, and that was not a provision no, no, I put no, to you. No, no. Just letting people know, just in case you think it's going to be like, oh god, next is going to be Princess and the Frog, and he's going to talk about Snow White. Nope. Uh, no, no. Well, okay. So this, the reason why I picked this one, and and and, and there's a bonus one that will connect to this. But yeah. I remember the moment I saw this for the first time in the theater, the day it came out. It's still every time I watch it, it just it makes me soar with happiness. The intro to 1999's Toy Story 2. Oh, wow. Is yes. the gr- I will never forget being in the theater. I know I was with my brother. It might have been with Margie. And I remember just going, because, okay, if you don't remember Toy Story 2, or, Toy Story 2, it begins with the whole sort of sleight of hand of you're seeing Buzz Lightyear go on a mission. You know, it starts with the Gamma Quadrant, Sector 4, okay? Mm-hmm. And it's an unbelievable realized mission Spoiler, it ends up where that it's Rex playing a video game, right? And he's yeah. and you're just seeing the video game just realized. I will never forget the music. Listen to that scene now. Make sure you put headphones on. Mm. The sound, the creative sound work in that 
is so amazing. There's like four Star Wars references. Yes. And in the opening. And, and uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Close Encounters too. of the Third Kind. But I'm just going to tell you, I just remember when that was opening up, and I remember just looking over my brother and going, Buzz Lightyear is the greatest. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, it's the it's one of the best openings. And that's, you know, a little preview of what my other option is, too, which I'll go talk about when we get to bonuses. But it's still just makes you so get on your feet and just go yay to those characters. Mm-hmm. I mean, ah, oh, I could just keep going on and on. It's it's absolutely incredible. And okay, and if you wonder what the Star Wars references are, he's got the Darth Vader breathing effect. Mm-hmm. Uh there's the Jedi from Return of the Jedi, the all eyeball that pops out at him when he's trying to enter Zerg's yeah, fortress. Yeah. There's a TIE fighter, I think, of uh, blaster sound and there's lightsaber sounds when he's going for the for the battery that's the hologram. Yeah. It just Oh, and I guess the other reason why I always just go to this one first of the Toy Story movies is that Mm -hmm. when you know the backstory, that movie is a miracle that it exists (laughs) and that it is good as it is. And it is fantastic. And if you don't know what we're talking about, go watch a couple YouTube videos on the making of Toy Story 2. Yeah. Because you just won't believe it. A lot of behind the scenes drama. You won't believe it. (laughs) So anyway, that's it. Toy Story 2, the opening. Very nice. Uh, all right, I'm, I'm continuing on a, a superhero thing, but this will be the end of my superhero thing. Ah. So we've uh, talked a lot in, in various shows and thing about the destruction that happens around superheroes. So like Man of Steel makes a big thing of this. That's actually what sets up all of Batman v Superman is watching Superman and you know and, and Zod flying through the city and destroying stuff. And you know, the Avengers make a big thing about we need to help people and get them out of here and get them to safety and stuff too. But I have to say, probably the people who are are traumatized by this are the people of Townsville when they hear the word tag. Because in the Powerpuff Girls movies in 2002, is, which is a lost classic, there is an unbelievable sequence in the middle of the movie. Now, I, unfortunately, the movie never gets as good as the sequence. But what the premise is, is that the Powerpuff Girls have gone to school for the very first time. And so they're, they're, they've gone through that typical day, and they get to go to recess. And the kids at their, at their school teach them about tag. And they're like, you know, you run and you tag the person. And then the Powerpuff Girls suddenly, like, take tag, and they start tagging each other. Faster and faster and faster, and it expands out, and suddenly they're flying through the entire city at full power, crashing through buildings and tagging each other. And, and at one point, there's a huge sphere that's being rolled through the city as their this tag game goes completely out of control and wrecks through the city. This is a really hard movie to find. Like it came out in 2002. Um, it's only available on DVD. It has never been released on any other format, and it is not. You can't stream it. It's not on any of the services. Uh, it's so I actually had to track down a four by three <laughs> formatted copy of the of the DVD. But it is worth it because it is one of the, the my favorite animated sequences because it just goes so completely insane so fast as these girls are destroying the city trying to tag each other you know oh, slapping funny. each other down and causing huge craters as they as they slam their sister into the ground yeah it's it's amazing i think Which, you, I'm, the- I'm sure i'm sure youtube probably has a, a compilation of it somewhere but uh yeah it's it's great and wait okay just just because the timeliness here Mm-hmm. Powerpuff Girls isn't that doing? Isn't that in the process of right now a live action remake? It is. And, and yes. Star, and, and to talk back to our Marvel connections, starring one of the stars of Agents of Shield, Chloe Bennett is going to be one of the Powerpuff oh. Girls. So CW is doing a sort of a CWized. I think they're, they're they're almost a genre in themselves of Powerpuff Girls of like them in their mid twenties. Like what, how what happens when the Powerpuff <laughs> Girls grows up? Well, that- I don't. Will it be good? I don't know. All I'm hoping is that. This will inspire them to re-release Powerpuff Girls movie yeah. in a high oh, definition yeah. format somewhere. Well, you would think that put it on Paramount that's Plus. Right for, whatever it is. Yeah. Oh yeah. my God. Of course. I mean, no. Yeah. That that's ripe for those kids who grew up with that. They're yeah. right at the point now where they should just be like, Yeah, I, I remember that. I want to see yeah. that again. Yeah. Because right. it, it was not a commercial success, so it came and went very quickly. Yeah. But it's oh, it's definitely man. worth checking out. Oh, what a great! That's a great pick. Yeah. Okay, so I have an interesting uh, fourth. It's my fourth pick. There is a movie. Okay, and I hadn't. I did not know this existed. Uh, one day, uh, my daughter and I were watching. She was much younger. We were watching. I think it was the two disc Little Mermaid DVD oh, mm-hmm. set. And on the second disc, 
that we, one day we were just trying to find stuff that I could find stuff that she would get, you know, interested in. And there is a bonus feature on the second disc, and it was a 2006 animated short film of the little match girl. Oh yeah. So so what this is this um, Hans Christian Andersen, you know the little the, the little mermaid. You've got he wrote many books. The uh, the little match girl is another book of his that he wrote uh, story, and uh, it's. It's dark. I mean, it's basically yeah. the story. It, it, it's it's uh, I think adapted from the life of his mother, but it's obviously adapted because we'll talk mm-hmm. about how it ends. Spoilers, um, and it's basically about this little girl in Russia. She is poor. She's trying to sell matchsticks during the winter on the street. Basically, she gets turned away by everybody. She longs for a time with her grandmother. She has vague memories of her grandmother and a beautiful house. And long story short, she ends up uh, spending the night in a alley because she go- went, go- won't be able to go home because if she goes home and her father finds out that she didn't sell any of the matchsticks, he will beat her. I should have mentioned this is a really dark, sad yeah. story, right? Yeah. So she has these keeps having these motion these these memories of her grandmother. She lights the matchsticks that she has left to keep herself warm. At the end, you realize, oh wait, the grandmother has actually shown up to take care of her. And the moment is, the final moment is, is that when you, it's done so well, as the grandmother picks her up, it, the camera switches to this back shot of the alley, and the grandmother and the child go through the wall. Mm-hmm. And you realize that her frozen corpse is on the floor of the, of the alley. She yeah. died. Let me, and okay, now if you're at this point, you're like, did you say this was a Disney short? Yeah. Yes, yes, it yeah. is, right? It's so amazing. It will, it will destroy you. Yes. Watching it. Find it. I think at one point it was on sale in iTunes. I don't know if it is anymore. I believe anymore. it's part of the Disney Shorts. Okay, so like it's on the Disney out, Shorts. Yeah, they put out like c- compilations of shorts, and it it's on there. It, it's it's had a variety of different releases and different things. If you have the old Little Mermaid two disc DVD, mm-hmm. it's on there. It's it's uh, Roger Allers is the director, and he's we know him. Well, I mean, you know, friend of our area. He was raised in Scottsdale, Arizona. Has a fine oh. arts degree from Arizona State University. Nice. Uh, this this was a this was like a little side project they did. They actually talk about it. I mean, they just they were just trying to see it. And and one of the neat things also too, if here's another reason why to watch it. It's one of those short films. There's no dialogue. Yeah. It is set to a particular piece of classical music. And I will tell you, it is just it is amazing. It will mm-hmm. move you tremendously. But that moment at the end is one of the greatest animated sequences because I, the first time I saw it, and by the way, I go back to the story, watching it with my daughter. Here's mm-hmm. my daughter. She's like three, four years old, and we're watching this, <laughs> and I am just bawling, yeah. like on the couch watching yeah. it. And she's like, Dad, are you okay? You're like, she's a three-year-old. Like, what's uh-huh. going on? Oh, you don't understand. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, my God. Little match girl. Look it so, up. So let me tell you my anecdote for this thing. <laughs> so so one of the things that I, I do is I, I have I bought all these DVDs and stuff, too, but I, I rip them, and I put them in my own... Plex server, so that basically I don't want to be switching discs for my daughter all the time, so that I have stuff set up so that on the iPad you can just get to all of the things to it. So one of the things that they did is they when they put out this compilation, they had all the Frozen shorts. So there's been a couple of Frozen shorts, so I put them on there as well. So one day, uh, my daughter comes to me, six years old or whatever, just in tears, just like despondent. And I was like, what happened? The little girl. And she couldn't sell. The, I'm like, oh no! Oh I god, realized, no! I realized she started watching the Frozen shorts because they're classified as Disney shorts, and it auto played onto. So she was just like, oh okay, what's this little girl in the in the in the snow? Wow. And oh, maybe this will be fun. And it, she was just like, Dad, the girl, girl, she. I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. So I, like, she is sure frozen. I, she I is just, frozen. I, I mean, I classified that so it would, like, she would never like, yeah, stumble don't across put it, in it the again. Whole thing. But yeah. Oh no. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, it's like it's bad enough when like now we're preparing you. You can sit down and watch it and be ready. But to not know what it is and just watch oh. like you, you basically just watch Olaf having his fun little adventure, and then suddenly there's a girl dying of exposure on the street. Hypothermia. She's yeah. frozen to death. She has no shoes. Yeah. Everyone tells her to take off. Oh. My. Yeah. <laughs> Go watch Little Match Girl. Yeah. So good. Very oh, nice. Boy. All right. So uh, so once again, uh, we 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 seem to be doing this. Uh, this ping pong game of shifting tones. So I'm going to just shift tones <laughs> dramatically. So um, it, old, old Hollywood is always an interesting place to, to set stories. So this this film from 1997, they decided to set their story in 
classic, you know, uh, Hollywood from the like 30s and 40s kind of thing. But instead of doing it typical, they decided to do it as people and animals. So in this, people are the stars, and animals are always kept to wacky side roles. They basically they're the you know the their their job is just to bark or moo or anything. But one cat comes to town and wants to be a star. And so this is this is the film is called Cats Don't Dance. It's from Warner Brothers Animation. It's another one of those ones that came and went really fast. Nobody ever saw it. Scott Bakula actually plays and sings as the the lead thing. But the sequence I want to talk about, there is a Shirley Temple-esque character named Darla Dimple. So Darla Dimple is the number one star in the world, and she does not want anybody getting in her way. So she definitely wants to keep the animals at bay like she wants to make sure that they never become stars because she doesn't want to share any of her power so she has this meeting with uh, with, uh, you know our lead character and she advises him that he wants to make a presentation to like show what it is they need to do it big and loud so she has this huge production number that she does that the, the thing that's great about this film in particular and a lot of times what animation does is is they can go extreme so like they're at her house but it looks like her house has like 90 foot ceilings and there's mm. there's you mean like it's it just becomes the her uh, manservant max is about 20 feet tall like it's like every time he shows up the shadow just falls over everybody as as he shows up it's it's all these really extreme different but it's this amazing song that she sings about uh having to you know if you want to make an impression you got everything has to be big and loud it's 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 a great song it's a great animated sequence and it's uh, one of those lost things in the same vein as iron giant they tried all these different things about the same era and it didn't catch on with audiences but it has nothing to do with the quality of the movie which is phenomenal so cats don't dance from 1987 check it out especially big and loud you have to wonder um warner brothers animation in the 90s what the heck yeah they were doing such amazing stuff and people just were not having it it wow okay and in the world now we're like you know despicable me three can come out and be like the highest grossing film of the year oh right it's just I, i i'm like man you guys were just so ahead of your time you know, different distribution, everything, right. awareness, the whole way, everybody. Yeah. The, yeah. yeah. I, I, I tell you, like, uh, you can look at a lot of stuff from that era, and not even just animated, but I mean, like, animated as we're talking about, I'll still stay focused on that, but like, this is the time period where a lot of fantastic movies crashed and burned. I mean, yeah. Batman Mask of the Phantasm is one of the best Batman movies of all mm. time and crashed and burned. Nightmare Before Christmas was a huge flop. And it was oh, at about yeah. the same time period. People just were not ready to for any type of experimentation. If it was not yeah. a mermaid or a beauty and a beast, they people were not interested. Wow, that's funny you say that. Night, Nightmare Before Christmas, the weekend that came out, yeah. I'll never forget. Margie and I actually were on a little vacation. We went to Universal Studios Ooh, in California. Nice. We saw it that uh, that weekend, the opening yeah. weekend at the theater there. Yeah. We were we were two of like seven people in the theater. Yes, I, I have, I have no that kidding. exact same memory because I went to the it was our local multiplex at the mall and the, I was like opening night and there were four people in the theater. Yeah, it well, was like, a huge flop. People like have the tattoos and there's Hot Topic has a whole section devoted to it. But you don't understand. Like this movie crashed and burned. And same thing, Cats Don't Dance. Most people don't even know it exists. No, I I didn't. I, I, yeah. That's why I'm like you said all that. I was like oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, what is that? Well, okay. So let's here. Let me segue into this. Also, one of Don Knotts' final roles. But <laughs> oh, <laughs> keep, keep what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm saying like it's 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 fantastic. Okay. Well, no. So here I'm coming to my my final fifth pick. But I'm, we're going to talk about bonus picks because we we have to. And I don't mean to be if anybody thinks this is cheeseball pick because you just mentioned the movie. I think I in a previous episode of Take Ten. I think I I have mentioned this movie many times before. Mm-hmm. 1999's The Iron Giant. Yeah, but I had to this because this is maybe my favorite animated moment ever. It, you could take a lot of different moments for this movie, but the one is where uh, Iron Giant is protecting Hogarth. They're running away. The planes are coming after him. Hogarth sees the bus. The Iron Giant gets to move out of the way. Of the bus falls down the ledge, and his mother's after them. And his rockets kick in. And the moment the Iron Giant flies up. And it goes, cuts to the scene where it's behind Hogarth's mom Mm -hmm. and the ledge. And you see the Iron Giant rise up and you get the immensity of it. That is one of the most 
perfectly timed, mm-hmm. choreographed, composed, animated sequences of all time. That's the shot. If they ever, I don't even know if I've missed it because <laughs> I have a big, great piece of Iron Giant art on my wall here in the office. That's the shot I want. And I want it as a mural on a wall <laughs> of, of where you're standing there and seeing the enormity of the Iron Giant. I won't get into the whole why that is so meaningful to the entire story because then, right. I, then I will cry and I will be sad. No <laughs> but uh, that moment is so amazing. It is epic. It It, it is timeless. Ugh. If you can't put enough love on that movie already, there it is. Iron Giant. Yeah, I agree. Rise, I say the Iron Giant just showed up on our last take ten too. So you know we yeah. all have our, our these these movies that are just seminal to our our entire creative yes. DNA. Like, no, and, no, there's nothing else right I can in. say. Yeah, it is. Uh, so. And, so, and so, all right. So it, this is interesting. This is why I'm I'm so glad we do this. This is why I'm so glad we're friends. And this is why this <laughs> these shows work out so well because we're coming full circle. Because what was your first pick? Kung Fu Panda Two. Yes. My final pick is Kung Fu Panda. Oh, we did not plan this. We did not discuss this at all. But this like awesome. my last one is Kung Fu Panda, and because I think there is one sequence in this movie that is maybe my favorite animated sequence of all time. This is what inspired us to have this whole conversation. Oh, uh, yeah. And I, I I can't say enough great things. So the the premise is, is this: they they establish the fact that there is one person in the in the kung fu panda world who is the most powerful martial artist of all time the most dangerous creature on the planet tai lung and so there's a rumor that has gotten out that he is going to escape and so they send out a, an emissary a, a duck to go and make sure that he is secure and it is a a prison designed for one person. Like, this entire prison is designed just to keep Tai Lung captive. Yeah. It is wow. manned by rhinos. And, like, every, and so the, and the, the rhino captain is so insulted that someone would think that they were going to be slacking our duties. He takes the duck and shows him. There's, like, five levels of protection. There's guards. There's spikes. There's chains. There's all these things are, are designed. Like, there's, like, there's no way he's possibly getting out. So they finally get to the top, and the... The, the duck is basically like, oh, okay, everything's fine. And as he goes out, one feather falls off of the duck and falls all the way down. And Tai Lung uses that feather to escape. He picks the lock, and then what begins is an unbelievably executed, timed, animated sequence of him one by one disabling all these defenses as he works his way up and defeats this entire army of guards to get out. And it shows you why he is the most formidable foe that anyone can face in this thing. It is one of the best villain introductions. It is one of the best action sequences. It is a masterclass in storytelling with almost no dialogue at all, except for stop, wait, get him. I mean, you know, you learn everything about this character without him having to say a single word. It is stunningly gorgeous, and I, I, I cannot say enough good things about it. I, it. Even if you're like, ugh, Jack Black, he's pandy, he eats a lot, whatever. No, like the amount of 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 uh, creativity and so they put into Kung Fu Panda. And even the whole series, I would say, but like this is to me is the pinnacle of DreamWorks animation entirely. This is, the, I think, this is the best piece of footage they have ever put together. Uh, I'm no okay. Here's the deal. I, I'm I have nothing to disagree on because you're to- totally right. That is a phenomenal sequence, and I would say the reason why it's a phenomenal sequence. If you've never seen this movie, you're like, I'm not watching Kung Fu yeah. Panda. No, here's why. Right. Here's why you should watch it. It isn't Jack Black. It's nothing else. The original Kung Fu Panda has perhaps the most ominous animated villain of all animated movies. Hmm. Tai Lung, Mm -hmm. it isn't just because Ian McShane is the voice and he's amazing. They did, I would say, it's it's Tai Tai Lung. The the second is probably Shan Yu from the original animated Mulan. I don't know what it is. I think what it is is, as I'll tell you, it's these two characters have eyes yeah. that are so different from the entire coloring and design of the of the creature. Yeah, it's piercing. It'll it 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 makes you yeah. cold. Like he's a snow leopard, and yes. he has like yellow glowing eyes. Oh, it's 
no and the whole way he does it with the feather and it's because yes. the, the I, they, like, when uh, they when they get down to the bottom of this pit yes. like you know which is like you know 30 feet deep he is like entirely chained up bound masked like his hands are behind his back his legs are are strapped to the ground oh, yeah. chains are, are on weights holding him in place the only thing that can move on his entire body is his tail and then you, like you, when you first see him, the first thing you see are those eyes just glowing in the darkness and that whole escape sequence is so crazy i mean some of the yeah. physics of what they do and everything is nuts yeah and it and it, and you really get a sense of foreboding like anxiety because yeah because you, just, you know that eventually this guy is going to fight wacky jack black the panda and you're oh. like like this guy's going to, to kill all of them like there's nothing everybody. can stop him that is such a great pick Oh. oh, I love it so much. I, I think I'm gonna. As soon as we're done with this, I'm gonna go watch it again. It's yeah, so that's <laughs> okay. So oh. that was, those were those were our ten picks. So I think we I think we covered quite the emotional gambit here. We've been from well from panda to panda, but you know we took a lot of diversions along the way. Well, no, and and, and in some of these, you know, you probably could have guessed, but sure. again, we're we're talking about the sequences, and those sequences are are hugely important, and and it'll give you a reason to to revisit those. And to marvel at, at some of the, the stuff we're talking about. Now, I'm, I'm actually just as excited talking about our bonus picks. Oh, okay. Our, our backup picks. I don't know yeah. if you are. I am. I, my, mine are, are slightly off of our, our main topic. So, like... Oh, okay. They're, they're, so, if you had stolen one, I didn't have actually have any backups to go in. Because these are ones that, like, okay, I, I made the rules about what this should be. These don't gotcha. fit into it. But I still want to talk about them. Okay, so well here, go I'll, ahead and I'll, start. So I'll give you mine. So my first one, and this is when I was talking about Toy Story two. I was I was getting ahead of myself. The intro to Toy Story three, yeah, is to me yes. just as exciting. It I mean, is. Toy Story it's, two. Sorry, I have three, the emotional. It's such the culmination of everything because it, it, there's so many callbacks to the first two movies yes. and Easter eggs and setting stuff up for the future. Yeah. Well, and I mean, you know, it's the every as each character comes on screen, Potato Head, he's got the yeah. money, money, money. One-eyed Betty, his wife comes with the chucks and Dr. And, Pork Chop shows up in the oh, sky. Mr. Evil, Mr. Evil Dr. Pork Chop uh, with his Dr. with Pork. his flying pig fortress. Uh-huh. And the dinosaur and like when when Jesse does the yodel and and uh-huh. T-Rex shows up. I mean, all of it is insane. Yeah. But then you culminate it with death by monkeys, <laughs> which is one of the most ridiculous animated things ever. Not even sequences, uh-huh. just things. Oh, and then again, they do. They even one up like Toy Story 2 of you're wondering what is going on here. Mm-hmm. And you realize that, yeah, it's reliving sort of the old VHS recording of Andy playing with his toys. Yeah. Oh, it makes it makes my heart s- swell. I just love it. It's great. Yeah. Is that the only alternate you had? No, and then okay. So my other two that just okay. Yeah. These are kind of ridiculous. Here, I'll go through them. I did want to say because I, when I rewatched this for this, it still marvels that I mean this gimmick has been done in live action movies. Mm-hmm. It's been done a lot now, but Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part One, hmm. when oh, Hermione yeah. Hermione does the con- when she's telling them the story of the Deathly Hallows. Yeah. Wow, that's good. Yeah. It's this, you know, shadow puppet, but not like. It is amazing. Like the yeah. detail of that animation. Watch it. Just go watch that sequence again if you haven't seen it in a while. Wow. That, God, yeah, is I, it good? I hadn't thought of that in a while. I actually it reminds me of like the animated sequence that's in Kill Bill as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, like no. And, and there's been a lot of other more recent movies well, too sure, that, sure. Have, I just that have done that. But yeah. no, like that one is amazing. And then the last one. Okay, and this is ridiculous. And I'm just going <laughs> to admit it. And this is not a, if, if we're talking about animated movies. This is not a movie that anyone with with, with young children should be watching at all because it's a hard R. Yeah. Two thousand seven, Walk Hard, the Dewey Cox story, <laughs> has one of and let me let me let me, let me reiterate, hard R. Hard R. Yeah. It's not walking hard because it, it's walking hard because it's a hard R. Okay. <laughs> but there is a moment in that movie. John C. Riley goes off to India. His character Dewey Cox. He meets with the Beatles. In in four uncredited roles, of uh, Paul Rudd is playing John Lennon, Jack Black is playing Paul McCartney, Justin Long is playing George Harrison, and Jason Schwartzman is playing Ringo Starr. They have some LSD. They do one of the funniest, which by the way, this this movie could have been on this list too, Yellow Submarine. Oh yeah, a lot of great I segments in that. that. Yeah, they do a take on the Yellow Submarine animation style. It's absurd. <laughs> <laughs> it's so ridiculous. Let's just say in the end, a walking machete cuts John C. Riley's character in half. And if you have to see the movie to know why that is. Yeah. 
Oh, it just bad trip. Bad trip, man. Bad trip. <laughs> it's it is such There you go. That 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 doesn't seem like it belongs on this list, but it does to me because I absolutely adore that. And again, another thing that has been that that has been used in other similar movies. I think like Harold and Kumar did their animated scene. Like you know what I mean? Like yeah, it's been done in comedies like that in live action comedies. But Dewey Cox is, you know, that's a whole thing of its own. Yeah. There you go. All right. So so my honorable mentions are are not from actual feature films. So that's why I sort of like went went off of the the thing. That's why they're here and they're not in the the main list. Uh, the first one is for those of you who watched. Jack Snyder's Justice League and sort of went, oh, we never got to see Superman face off against Darkseid. Well, I can tell you, it has already happened. It's amazing, and you can watch it right now because in the final episode of Justice League Unlimited, you actually get to see them go toe-to-toe, and it is unbelievable. It's some of the best Superman action of all time. Like, it, it's... They had been building up Darkseid. At one point, he even mind controlled Superman, and you know, and so Superman had broken free. This was they were building Darkseid up over the whole time of like nothing can stop him. He's just unstoppable, unstoppable, unstoppable. And then finally, it comes down to only the people are left are Darkseid and Superman, and Superman goes after him and then says some like stuff you never really think about before. He said, you know. I walk through this world having to be so careful. I look around and I, I can't do anything to be... To do this thing. I, I live in a world of cardboard and I don't want to break anything. But with you, I don't have to hold back anymore. And just goes at... I mean, like, he hits him so hard it shatters every window in Metropolis. It is unbelievable. That, just like Unlimited... It was one of the best animated series of all time. But, like, if you really want to see Superman at his full power going after somebody, man, that check it out. The final oh, episode. I mean, like, oh. the entire series is worth it. But, like, if you really, if you were, like, thinking you got denied the big fight, boy, you need to watch that. It's great. I watched it again, too, and it is still amazingly good. Oh, and then nice. my last one uh, is not... I don't know this is how this fits in because it's not really a television show, but it's not really a movie. It's Wallace and Gromit. Uh, so in the, oh. in the wrong trousers, they have one of the best chase sequences of all time. Uh, so it's really hard to explain, but uh, essentially there is a penguin who's pretending to be a rooster who is also a master criminal who has been living in their house and. They get into so Gromit is then trying to is the dog who's trying to give it, and so they have a model train race. And so through this, uh, their house, they're going around and like there's there's a they're at one point having to frantically lay track in front of the the <sighs> engine as it's going full speed, and it's all stop motion animation. Like you watch it and you just wonder how in the world they were able to pull this off with little clay puppets that they moved slightly yeah. from time to time. It is one of the most thrilling sequences, and it was all done with people sweating their way through a warehouse somewhere in England, slowly posing <laughs> dolls, you know, an inch at a time. It's it's um, it's an amazing, amazing sequence. All the Wilds and Gromises are great, but man, that train sequence is really, really something. I okay. Wow, you just added a whole new. I started having Chicken Run. Yes. Like, oh yeah, the, yeah. All of the yeah, exactly. Like, all of the, the stuff. I mean, I actually looked at a lot of Lakey and stuff to be on this list, and they 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 almost made it. There's there's a couple things in Paranorman that are that are still just oh, like I look at it and yes. go, I don't know how you did that. I I because I mean, okay. Side note, yeah. what those what what I what I have just incredible admiration on on those animators is that's the kind of thing. Like if I, I if I was trying to do that, I can tell you what would happen. Mm-hmm. I would film like I would spend two days filming like a sequence, moving mm-hmm. everything around, taking, and then I would watch it, and then I would realize I forgot to change the one guy in the background. Right, and then I would be done. And you've lost, <laughs> you've lost a week of work. No, dude. Of that. And then I would go, yeah, I'm not doing. That. No, no, yeah. no, this is not a good idea. <laughs> like how they do that? Oh, come yeah. on. Oh, Artman Studios, man, they are the they are the top. Great. Picks. Yeah. Oh, yeah, this that totally was super ex- fun. I mean, like, yes. It just, it just these all these sequences just give me so much joy. So yes. Like, just, yes. Even just remembering them. So I'm, I'm hoping that you who are listening will go and seek out some of these things and then just marvel at what animation can do. So I hope we either made you remember some fun things or allowed you to go and seek some stuff out that will give you the same amount of joy that we had in reminiscing about them. Absolutely. So thank you for listening. We'll be back when we have another list of uh, 10 things that we think you should know about.
End program. I love the conversations that so many of our hosts have had on their shows. Steve and JJ on Trailer Rewind, Ray and Ocean on Silver Linings, even Tommy's short-lived Wait, Wait, Hear Me Out. So many listeners want to make sure they've watched the movie before tuning in to any discussion on our podcasts. Well, you know, the best way to watch the movie is to look it up on our watch page. Our watch page lists all the movies that we have discussed on all the shows from the Next Reels family of podcasts, including the one you're listening to right now. It's your one-stop shop for Apple and Amazon links where you can rent or buy the movie. Try the rewind movies like Raw. The Nice Guys. The Peanut Butter Falcon. Or Free Fire. No, no, wait, hear me out. Movies like Josie and the Pussycats or Return of the Living Dead. Or Silver Linings movies like Repo Men, Daredevil, and The Wolfman. Plus, by using those links to rent or purchase movies, Apple and Amazon will show us a little bit of love, which allows you to support our family of shows with minimal effort. It's a great way to support the show and find something to watch. That's right. Head over to thenextreel.com slash watch to pick out your next movie and start watching today. 